to really understand the logic of minstrelsy, we need to understand the ways that it coincided with and intersected with the institution of slavery. So as you may well know, slavery in this country lasted from the 1600s until 1865. The first slaves arrived in what would become the U.S. in 1619, and it wasn't until 1865 and the 13th Amendment that slavery was abolished. In the course of those 200 years, over 40 million Africans were taken from their homes in shackles and transported across the Atlantic Ocean. So we can see how, as an institution, slavery depended on this idea of expropriation, of confiscating property. Again, taking Africans from their homeland, transporting them across the sea. This part of the journey was often referred to as the Middle Passage. And then treating those humans as property, treating black bodies as the property of whites. So this means that black bodies began their life on U.S. shores as property. And the logic of slavery gave owners the rights to whatever slaves produced. If we extend that idea of expropriation of labor to encompass not just physical labor, but cultural labor as well, we can see how minstrelsy was actually in many ways an extension of the logic of slavery. So white performers took black culture and put it to their own uses. Now, dance was a part of minstrelsy, but it was also a very important part of slavery as well. And sla dance and slavery actually functioned in two very different ways. On the one hand, slaves were often forced to dance by their masters. And this was a practice known as dancing the slaves, began on the slave ships during the Middle Passage. It was a really brutal form of exercise in which the masters forced slaves to dance as a form of exercise, as a way of increasing their value on the auction block. Later, slaves were often also forced to provide entertainment for their masters on plantations. So it was actually slaves who often served as accompanists playing vi something like the violin for white dances, um, ballroom type dances. On the other hand, slaves also danced for their own sake, of their own volition. So as a way of releasing some of the tension after the physical labor they were forced to perform, and as a way, crucially, of forging community among themselves and retaining some aspects of their African cultural traditions. So often slaves would have private dance celebrations, maybe somewhere secluded in, in the woods outside the watchful eye of their white masters. One important dance that emerged during slavery is called the Ring Shout that also had important ties to black religious traditions. And the Ring Shout was a sacred African-derived dance in which the participants performed a kind of rhythmic shuffling step and clapping movements while rotating counterclockwise in a circle. And the dance is really interesting because scholars have speculated that it evolved because in Christianity, which was forced on many slaves, adherents were prohibited from dancing. And one of the criteria for dancing was the crossing of the feet. So by developing this shuffling style in which their feet didn't actually cross, they were able to evade the ban on dancing and yet practice this ring shout. So this is an example how sometimes dance in slavery developed despite strict codes and regulations. And the ring shout is also important because some scholars have speculated that during the rhythmic shuffling in that circle formation, some of the early seeds of jazz dancing started to develop. You can view an example of the ring shout at this site here and see if you notice connections to the development of, of jazz movements. So one of the naughtiest issues that haunts the institution of minstrelsy is the question of authenticity. And as we've established, minstrelsy was based on imitation. So that raises the question, what was the relationship of what was performed in minstrelsy to real African-American culture? 
to what extent were White's performances based on authentic black expressive traditions, like some of the slave dances that developed? Now, it's a question that's nearly impossible to answer definitively, but scholars generally agree that minstrelsy was an exaggerated misrepresentation of black culture, but at the same time, it bore the influence of some genuine African-American traditions like dance. So again, while white man minstrelsy was primarily a derisive imitation of black culture, black dance received wide exposure during the heyday of minstrelsy and began to in influence American culture in some profound ways. And I want to call your attention to two dance forms that emerged during minstrelsy that are important. The first is the cakewalk, which was a popular form of the walk around that the end of the first section of the minstrel show. In the cakewalk, uh, a, a paired couple promenaded in a circle using high steps and um, high kicks. And cakewalk is really interesting. It emerged as a slave dance in which, as a competition, so the winners of the competition were awarded a cake. That's the derivation of the name cakewalk. But the way the dance evolved was that black slaves on the plantations observed the ballroom dances of their white masters who were dancing European style forms of ballroom dance. They developed their own form of dance that was actually mocking their white masters. Um, so that's what the high stepping and kicking is from. But now their white masters didn't realize that they were being mocked. So when white observers watched the black slaves performing the cakewalk, they imitated it in return without realizing that they were being mocked in the dance. So this is what one scholar has called the, a merry-go-round mer merry of appropriation with blacks imitating whites who then imitated blacks imitating them. You can see some clips of the cakewalk at this site here. Another important dance to emerge from minstrelsy was known as the buck and wing which was really just a combination of shuffles and jigs, and it kind of became a generic term for a variety of black dance steps. You can see a clip of the buck and wing here, and you can tell how this was actually the basis for what became tap dance. I also want to call your attention to some performers who emerged during minstrelsy and or were popular at the height of minstrelsy. The first was Thomas Daddy Rice, who was a white performer who, again, blackened his face and performed a number called Jump Jim Crow in the 1820s. And this is an image of him here, and you can see how grotesquely he's depicting blackness here. The number Jump Jim Crow that he performed was an exaggerated comic parody of black song and dance. It was supposedly based on his observations of a cri crippled African-American man. And the song, Jump Jim Crow, became a 19th century hit that Rice performed all over the country. The song had the lyrics, wheel about and turn about and jump, do just so, every time I wheel about, I jump Jim Crow. So this Jump Jim Crow actually became a, an expression to refer to black dance. And you may have heard of the expression Jim Crow in other contexts. It actually became used to, as a way of describing segregation. And I find it really interesting that the term for segregation actually stems from minstrelsy and from this, black, this white version of a black dance. So Rice was important because he helped sow the seeds of minstrelsy. Another important performer at the time was William Henry Lane, who was also known as Master Juba. He was a free black performer who, uh, as you'll recall, he wasn't actually allowed to perform on the minstrel stage, but his popularity coincided with the popularity of minstrelsy. And he assimilated syncopated steps into his jigging, and this helped give rise to tap dance. So sometimes he's considered one of the fathers of tap dance and he was considered the best dancer of his day. Finally, we have Burt Williams, another important performer, who came a couple of generations after Rice and Lane. 
um, and was famous in the late 19th and early 20th century. Williams was born in the West Indies and became famous um, in vaudeville for his comic pantomimes. So again, he was a black man, but because of the conventions of blackface, as you can see here, he was forced to darken his skin further to conform to what a minstrel performer looked like. He danced with a partner named George Walker, and together they helped popularize the cakewalk as a stage form. We'll come back to him in a little bit. Now, although minstrelsy's heyday was over 150 years ago, as an institution, minstrelsy has received a lot of heated attention in the past 25 years by scholars. And the there are some actually heated debates among scholars. The disagreement is mostly over whether blackface minstrelsy should be viewed as an entirely and wholly racist practice, or whether we need to try to understand its racial politics in, in more nuanced and complicated terms. It seems like the more scholars look at it, the less consensus there is about how best to understand it. So let's take a look more closely at, at both of these views. View A we could call love and theft, and this is a view most influentially advanced by the, a scholar named Eric Lott, and he maintains that white audiences' attraction to blackface minstrelsy suggests that there's something very complicated going on there, that alongside the racist dimensions of the form, there's an element of white desire for black culture. So Lott points out that the height of minstrelsy's popularity coincided with the abolitionist movement, the campaign to end slavery. Both took off at the same time around the 1840s. Lott sees this timing as significant and raises the question of whether minstrelsy might, be, might share some sympathies with the abolition movement. In other words, he suggests that minstrelsy might have helped give rise to some pro-black sentiment. Basically, he's arguing that the minstrel show had multiple and contradictory political effects, but that there may have been this brief shared history between the form and ideologies of liberation. You can read more about this kind of view at this PBS website here. One thing that's interesting about this particular view is that it approaches white performers turned to black culture as evidence that blackness carried some kind of symbolic power in American society. Again, let's remember that blacks were property at this time, legally, in the U.S., but that, that in being drawn to black culture for this most popular form of entertainment, blackness at least had this sim symbolic power. So perhaps, Lot is suggesting, whites felt some sort of liberation from the constraints of their own white Protestant Anglo cultural conventions. That means more free to engage in expressive acts like singing and dancing when they put on the blackface mask. So again, this is a kind of ambiguous but symbolic power for blackness. There are some scholars who strongly disagree with Lot. So instead of characterizing minstrelsy as a matter of love and theft, they argue that we need to keep the focus on the overwhelming racism of the form. So this view has been advocated by the dance scholar Brenda Dixon Godschild. And she holds that Lot's focus on white desire is actually detracting from the brutal racism of minstrelsy and the long-lasting harm it did to black bodies. She points out that in seeking to master and mock African-American expressive styles of performances, whites were actually trying to control African-Americans. And her concern with Lott's view is that it has a Eurocentric focus, meaning that it privileges the white perspective, this focus on, the, on white male desire for black culture over and above the actual bodies of African-Americans. And you can get a sense of this view at this PBS site. 
in support of Gottschild's view, as, as other scholars have pointed out as well, even as minstrelsy coincided with the campaign to end slavery, it also helped serve as a justification for slavery. So it did this, it helped justify slavery by creating and disseminating stereotypes of African Americans that helped reinforce the alleged appropriateness of slavery. So let's consider some of the stock figures that emerged out of minstrelsy. These figures appeared, often appeared as characters in minstrel shows, but their images then outlasted the minstrel show itself. So the first is Jim Crow. We saw that term with Thomas Daddy Rice, but Jim Crow actually became a character in the minstrel show who was typically just a lazy, shuffling slave, pretty incompetent, only suited for life on the slave plantation. There was also the figure of Mr. Tambo, who was depicted as a, a joyous, carefree musician, which helped give rise to the idea that blacks were quote-unquote natural performers. Then there was the character of Zip Coon, who was depicted as a pretentious free black. So he was always trying to imitate and aspire to the ideals of white society, but always did so imperf imperfectly in ways that made him a kind of laughing stock. Then there was the character of Uncle Tom, and you may know that the name Uncle Tom comes from Harriet Beecher Stowe's famous novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin, which actually coincided with the height of minstrelsy. This figure of um Uncle Tom became a stock character in minstrelsy as well, and again, he was depicted as a, as a docile older man. You might think of Bill Robinson's later performance um, in that light, remember when he was paired with Shirley Temple. The, the unthreatening, gentle, older man. Uncle Tom actually became a derogatory term to refer to some African Americans who were seen as being too subservient to whites. Then finally there's the figure of the Mammy who was always depicted as an overweight matronly figure, again serving white families over her own family. And in 2011, the film The Help came out and actually sparked renewed debate about how far away we've gotten from the image of the mammy. Now, both of these sets of views, either seeing minstrelsy as a combination of love and desire for black culture, or seeing minstrelsy as racist justification for slavery are both supported and contradicted by an important fact, which is that it was largely white ethnic minorities who participated in and performed blackface minstrelsy. So in the 19th century, Irish Americans were the most common group of minstrel performers. However, we might think of Irish Americans today, during the 19th century, they were seen as not quite white when they first immigrated to the U.S. So there were a lot of stereotypes about Irish Americans and they were seen as inferior to other Euro-Americans. Now there's two ways of understanding Irish American participation in minstrelsy. The fact that they were drawn to that institution could be seen as their identification with another disenfranchised group, African Americans. On the other hand, it could be seen as Irish Americans attempts to whiten themselves by participating in this racist form. And it's also interesting to note that while Irish Americans would put on blackface, so perform their versions of blackness, they could also always take off that blackface mask, thus reinforcing their whiteness, whereas African Americans could never take off their blackface. 